uh, yeah, do you have one? Well, yeah, I don't know what to say. Thanks a lot. OK. Fantastic. Thanks for that. Okay, hello everyone. Okay, hello everyone. So you guys are not done with the midterm season yet? Okay, I, I see from the from the audience. All the best with all the midterms. I guess uh, hopefully one thing you enjoy with that course is we don't have a midterm to relieve a little bit the, the weight on you uh, in the middle of the semester. I know on the other hand, we also have all these submissions for labs projects, so I'm, I'm not completely saying the truth. Um, anyway, so all the best with all your exams. So what we have stopped at last time before the reading week uh, is we started discussing real-time scheduling. And because this has been a couple of weeks and the topic we're going to continue today, I'm going to quickly sw uh, skim what we have done last time first and then continue the discussion. Good. So we said that the overall outline we want to do first of all, why are we doing what we are doing in these couple of lectures? Is if you recall the very big picture, one of the very important layers in real-time embedded systems is, well, the actual real-time operating system, right? The ARPUS. Um, and there are companies and startups and what well, there is a whole business that only that is only focusing on in fact this layer which is the artus layer so it's a very important layer uh, for example here in, in canada uh, if you don't know like blackberry originally they, they had a, a subdivision uh, that are focusing on real-time operating systems for automotive and then my understanding is that a few years ago this was more or less purchased by huawei uh, this is in ottawa uh, and it's one of the very promising operating systems for automotive uh, and it's being uh, here in Canada. So that's that's one example of, uh, well, of contributing to this big industry. Uh, so, yeah, this is basically why we're discussing all of this, because, well, in the lab, you see free artists as an example, but that's only one example. There are so many of them. VxWorks, there, there's... Uh, uh, other uh, artists, which is industrial, open source, closed source. Uh, we want to know the fundamentals such that if you get and interact with any operating system, real time operating system, you know, in fact, what is the base kernel is or what it's doing. Uh, and well, you know, it's from an engineering perspective, not just from a user perspective. This is why we do what we do in these couple of lectures. And then we said, okay, around this Artus discussion, we're going to have, uh, well, multiple items. We're going to simplify the problem for us first, then complicate it a bit by a bit. So we defined what we call the task model. What is a task model? So you build some sort of a mathematical formulation for the tasks you have in your system. What is a task? You can think of it as, well, a thread of an application or an application. In fact, a task is just a theoretical uh, entity that represents computation, right? So it can be a program, it can be a thread in multi-threaded program, it can be, well, usually it's not multiple programs because each program has its own uh, 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 its own characteristics, uh, 
But the best thing, if you want it easy, one task can represent one group or one thread. And then, okay, we said, let's really define our task model. How does this, like, this task looks like? What is its behavior? And what we are looking for from a real-time perspective from that task? And uh, this is basically the introduction of the task model. If you recall, we ended up saying we're going to focus mainly in periodic tasks. Uh, we said there are aperiodic, periodic, and sporadic. And these definitions are based on what is the reaction of the activation of the task? Is this task activated by an external event? So in that case, this is a periodic task. Is this task activated by our time trigger, which means every certain period of time it gets activated, then this is periodic task. Okay, this is periodic task, but in fact, I'm not saying it has to be activated every single period, but instead at a maximum of T, right? And this is basically the, the sporadic task. And we said among the, these three, the most apparent one and the, the easiest one, in fact, is the periodic task model. Why that's the case? Uh, well, because periodic tasks are very easy to uh, expect their behavior, right? They have a very predictable fashion of execution. Every single T, which is my period, I'm going to activate the task once, which is what we call the job. If you remember from last time, we said if it's a periodic task activated every T, if we take one single T, one single period in instance, we call the execution of that program during that period a job, right? And then tasks, well, theoretically have infinite number of jobs, which means you do the program again and again. Think of a car that is moving all the time, you do the perception, right? And once you finish one thing, you repeat it. You repeat it every single period of time. So for that reason, we said we're going to focus first in periodic tasks. And then we said, okay, out of simplicity, we're going also to assume that the deadline is equal to the period. What is a deadline? Well, as part of our task model, we know that this is real time. Each task has to finish execution within a certain period of time that we call the deadline. And a very big, a very big chunk of the real time work is in fact to say, you take one task, you try to come up with a bound on its execution time in worst case. This is usually referred to as a worst case execution time. And then you want to make sure that all the time, your worst case execution time of the task is less than or equal to its deadline. Why that's the case? Remember the very first few lectures in the, uh, the very first few slides in the lecture zero in the course. We had the airbag example. If you really finish your task after the deadline, well, you lost your driver life, for example, right? And we defined real-time in various systems as systems that don't care only about correct functionality, but also about the time that it takes to execute this functionality. So if you have the right answer in the wrong time, that is considered incorrect by a real-time operating system. Or both this to a MATLAB code, as I give you this very uh, easy example, that while you, you care about the answer of, or well, the simulation result of your MATLAB, Regardless of whether it takes a minute or five minutes, it doesn't really matter much, right? Good. So we said we're going to start by a very simple model where our deadline is equal to the period for the task. And for this one, we started starting some scheduling algorithm. So if I go back to the outline, we said, well, let's take a simple, well, this is a simple task model. Let's also take a simple model for the hardware, which is just a single processor, a unique processor system. And then we are going to schedule a set of tasks, a set of periodic tasks into this single processor. And we discussed a couple of scheduling algorithms. One of them is fixed priority, which is rate monotonic. The second one is dynamic priority, which is earliest deadline first or EDF, right? So this is what we have covered in uh, these examples, right? So if I go here, we had the RM examples, and then we, to be able to assess RM or EDF for any other scheduling algorithm, we needed to make some definitions. One of the important definitions is, well, what is your schedulability condition? How do I know whether my task set is schedulable using this algorithm in this hardware or not, right? That's the fundamental question, right? It's a very, very important question. It's in fact not easy to answer in real, in real use cases. So you have three inputs to you into the problem the task set, the algorithm that you want to use, and the hardware resources. Let's apply this to our own example. Our hardware is very simple, just it's a Yoni processor, nothing more, not very complex. Our task set is periodic task set, so where the red line is equal to the period. And the scheduling algorithm we want to use here in this case is rate monotonic. 
And we need to come up with an answer for that question. Can I schedule this task set using RM in a uniprocessor system or not? And we said to be able to do this, we define what we call the task utilization, right? So task utilization simply The execution time of the task, the actual execution time C, or the worst case execution time C, if you if you want to talk about the worst case, divided by the period. Why this is intuitive? Because you know that you repeat this task every T, so you have your run of time as T, and it only executes within T for C period of time. For example, if I take this period, I know that my C is four, so I'm in fact executing four. So in reality, this task, if it runs alone, it executes four out of each unit of the processor. So its utilization is 50%, right? Does it make sense? Then we said, okay, this is for a single task. Do all the utilization for all the tasks, add them all, their utilization, there is first one physical limitation, which is this, their utilization cannot exceed, what do you think? 100%, right? Because if you have a single processor, you have only utilization of one. If you have a set of tasks that their utilization exceed one, well, regardless of the algorithm, remember we said our problem has three inputs, scheduling algorithm, hardware, task set. Regardless of what algorithm you use, your, your hardware, your processor can only support 100% utilization. So in that case, if, you, if your task utilization exceeds 100%, no algorithm, no algorithm is going to help you. So this is a physical limitation, right? But we said most of scheduling algorithms, in fact, even put more limitation than the physical limitation, because physical limitation is theoretical. It's just Ignoring uh, switching overheads is, is ignoring how you can schedule those tasks. It's not always possible to preempt the task. How do you assign priorities? So we said, for example, in late monotonic, our actual utilization uh, condition is not one, but instead, if you remember, it was the following condition. It was, let me show you the equation. It was n2 to the power 1 over n minus 1. What does this mean? If you have two tasks, then n is 2, so you substitute 2 to the 0.5 minus 1. In our case, this, for example, gives you, uh, well, in, in that case, for a case of two tasks, it gives you 0.8 something, which means if the utilization of these two tasks exceeds 0.8, well, in rating monotonic, it's a little bit even more involved. I cannot say it's not schedulable, right? Because remember, we said, well, in schedulability condition, there are two cases. There is a sufficient condition and necessary condition, right? We said a sufficient condition means if you meet the condition, you are sure that you're going to schedule these tasks using that algorithm. For example, in our case here for rate monotonic, the submission of our task set is 0.75, while my utilization bound is 0.8. Did I meet the condition? Yes. What does this mean? It means I satisfied my condition because the rate monotonic schedulability is a, a, a sufficient condition. It means, well, you are sure that you are schedulable. So you can, in fact, decide analytically by proving it mathematically that these two tasks can be scheduled using rate monotonic. Good. The problem in rate monotonic comes to the point that what if you exceed your utilization bound? Now comes the second part of the condition, which is it's not a necessary condition, which means in some cases, even if your task set exceeds the bound, you can end up being schedulable as well, right? So the necessary condition does not answer the question of what happens if, if you don't meet the condition, right? So rate monotonic is a sufficient but not necessary condition, right? I believe you should have heard of this necessary, not sufficient, etc. either in the data structure algorithms course, 2SI, or your software engineering course, because this is a very common terminology in software engineering for algorithms. Did you guys hear these two terms before, or aside from last lecture? If you don't know this concept, let's stop for a second and let's talk about it. That's a very important concept in engineering in general, right? So let's really discuss it, right? What I'm more concerned with in this course is trying to, to, to fill in any gaps you might have in some other courses such that you have the, well, wide engineering concepts. I, I don't really, well, I do care, but not much about what we cover and what we don't cover, right? Uh, I care more about what concepts are conveyed to you being in, in the last year. If you don't know what is this, necessary, sufficient, or a little bit confused about them, ask questions and we can spend time about them. Do you see what this means and then how we apply it for rate monotonic? Is everyone comfortable with the terminology? Okay. 
So, so in that case, because it's not a necessary condition, if the case that I exceed the bound, there are cases where I can be schedulable and there are cases where I can be non schedulable right? So here in this, in this example, we went through the case that my utilization is exceeding the bound, but in fact, I ended up having a scheduling algorithm. Well, I was able to write an example, right? In the exam, if I ask you, if I give you a task set and I tell you, well, tell me whether it's schedulable or not, the first thing you will do is you can create the bound. If it does not exceed definitely schedulable, and you show me an example, if it's not schedulable, then the bound does not help you. There is another detailed analysis that I added in the slides later on that I told you it's optional. So there is an analytical formula proof also to how to come up with a necessary and sufficient condition, but we're not going to cover it. It's a little bit. Well, it's not very tough, but it's a little bit not required at the level we're talking about. So instead, you can try examples, right? So if I go to the second example here, well, I wasn't able to come up with any with any uh, with any with well, I, I cannot come up with any possible scenario where I can make these two tasks schedulable, which means I can say, well, they end up being unscheduled, right? And then for this specific example, we kind of discussed that are they not schedulable because of the physical limitation? Or it's only because of rate, rate monotonic limitation. And when we discussed it, if you remember, we said, well, it's only because of rate monotonic. Because in fact, uh, rate monotonic has to preempt, because it's fixed priority, it has to preempt a task. If another higher priority task comes into play, even if this other higher priority task can wait a little bit, right? And this stemmed the, the, the need for discussing some more advanced algorithm, a dynamic priority algorithm, which we, what we call EDF, earliest deadline first. And we said EDF does, it does not state the priority statically, but instead, since the priority is based on the dynamic behavior of the tasks, you look at any single moment when you need to make a scheduling decision, you look into all your tasks or your, all your running jobs, you see what is the one with the earliest deadline, and then you pick this one. Why this is intuitive, why in fact it has been proven to be optimal, well, think of what you do in your own daily life. If you have multiple midterms, and then one of them is after two hours, and the other one is after two days, there is, and, and you need to study for both. There is no point at all that, in fact, or no one will tell you, well, ignore, well, aside from that, the fact that you might not really care about the, 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 the urgent midterm, but let's say both have the same kind of importance in the system, which is our task. You will spend the remaining two hours to study for the earliest one, because this is the more urgent one. Later on, you have more time, more slack for the loose one, right? So earliest deadline is a concept that has been applied in well, supply chain, scheduling, and uh, queuing theory in, in many other domains, in communication systems, because it makes sense, right? It's intuitive, even for a human being life. Uh, and by doing this, we said EDF is optimal, which means if there is any task set that is schedulable using any other algorithm in a unique processor system, EDF can schedule them. Why? Because its utilization bound is one, which is the physical bound. Right? So if your utilization bound and if you if the total utilization for tasks exceeds one, we are sure, as we said at the beginning, no no scheduling can schedule any not EDF, not any other one. Right. And then we went through the example of while well, changing priorities along the running example to make sure that we always meet the deadlines of the early stuff. Good. Do you guys have any question on the two examples we covered last time? I would have spent 20 minutes really revisiting all of this, but that's very important. Is there a question? OK, and then we said, well, what if I start relaxing my constraints in the model a little bit? What if the red line is not equal to the period? I said, OK, EDF is still optimal, rate monotonic, which sets the priority based on the uh, on the on the period. And instead, it will set the priority based on the deadline, and we call it deadline monotonic or DM, right? And DM operates exactly in the same way. That's the exact analysis that I told you. Maybe you can just ignore. Uh, it seems like less than half a page proof, but you don't have to worry about it. And then now comes into the interesting parts, the, the parts that we stopped at last time. This simplistic view of a set of tasks that are independent. If you look into all the three examples we had here, we never mentioned that tau one and tau two depend on each other. We assume that they are independent entities. Each one starts executing finishing, being interrupted regards the other one, right? So they don't wait for something from each other. In the reality, that's not the case, right? Think of a car, for example. I might have give you, given you this example last time. 
there is a sensor in the wheel that is called the wheel sensor that collects some data, mainly about your acceleration and speed and direction, and then sends this data into your motor control, cruise control, into your logging system, if you have a GPS into the GPS, into multiple tasks with even multiple criticalities. That means tasks, in fact, share data, right? communicate to each other. Well, but if you start sharing resources, which includes data or a critical section or, or some hardware resource like a sensor or input-output device, well, you cannot say I'm independent from each other. If someone, if one task is accessing that resource now, you cannot really access, right? So in that case, there is some dependency. The reason that we ignored the dependency earlier uh, is, well, it complicates the analysis. You have to, to take care of these shared resources. And we said it will create the problem of uh, uh, priority inversion, which means think of this example. I have a lower priority task and I have a higher priority task. And well, it's a preemptive scheduling, which means if the high priority comes, it has to really kill the lower priority and start executing. The problem might be if the lower priority task is currently accessing a resource that is also needed by the high priority one, you must wait until this task releases it, right? Because it's a resource that has been acquired, think of a semaphore, for example, or a token. You acquire the token. If you are preempted before you release the token, all the tasks that need that resource will have to wait until you release it, because this is how critical sections work or semaphores work, right? So in that case, which you, know, you have seen in lab two, and I would assume in an operating system course. So in that case, there is some dependency. I cannot really preempt the lower priority task immediately. And now the behavior of the higher priority task depends on the lower priority task. This dependency creates what we call priority inversion. Why? Why it's priority inversion? Because a higher priority task right now cannot simply exercise its higher priority by preempting anyone but instead is waiting and depending on the lower priority task to finish its access before it can start, right? So to see an example, let's say we have three tasks, okay, tau one, tau two, tau three, and assume that the priority is in the uh, descending order, which means tau one is the highest priority, tau two is medium, and tau three is the highest. And then let's say there is a critical section which is uh, a resource, it can be a software code, it can be a sensor, it can be hardware, it can be memory, it can be anything. We're abstracting it at the, the, the scheduling level. So this, uh, our resource is the green one. And then it say the higher priority, well, I start here, tau one is not activated yet. So in my system, well, what task do I have ready right now is tau three. Even if it's the lowest priority, the higher priority ones don't have something to do, so I can schedule it. So at time zero, I can schedule the lower priority task. And then while scheduling, it acquires that resource. It sends a request, it obtains it, right? Or in a software section, it asks for the lock and it obtains it. So tau 3 accesses the green resource. But then after it exits, after one time unit, I have an activation from the higher priority task, tau 1. Good. According to some sort of fixed priority scheduling, let's say RM, for example, I'm going to BM tau 3. I'll start tau 1, right? So what happens at this time unit? is you preempted tau three and started tau one. Good. Why? Because you apply rate to tonic, for example. And then you start executing tau one. Now, tau one executes for two time units, and then it asks for resource A, for the green resource. Well, there is a problem. You cannot obtain the green resource, right? Think of if you are running two threads, the log has been acquired already by a preempted thread. So if tau one checks for the lock, it will find it one. So it cannot obtain it, right? So in that case, it has to wait. So tau one is waiting here. Well, the scheduler looks into the system. Do what do I have to schedule? Tau one is preempted. Tau two they didn't arrive yet. Then I start tau three. So you, you start tau three again, then tau three continue executing with the resource. Well, tau three is lucky in that case. But then after executing in one time unit, another task or another job from another task arrives, which is tau two. Well, as an RM scheduler, again, you look into all the bending jobs. You have one from tau two, you have a running one from tau three, which one to pick? It's tau two because it's higher priority. So tau two here preempts tau three and start executing. And then it keeps executing for some time. The problem now is during that execution of tau two, tau two, is preempting and delaying tau three, right? Well, 
sensible because tau2 is higher periods. The problem is because tau2 is delaying tau3 and tau1 is waiting for tau3 to release the lock, indirectly tau2 is delaying tau1, right? According to rate Newtonic, that's impossible to happen because tau2 is lower period. And so why it's called priority inversion. So at that point, a lower priority task can delay a higher priority task because of access to shared resources. And so why we call it priority inversion. Is there any question? Stop for a second and take questions. Those examples, if you try to study them in your own without really going through the explanation or we think about it together, it would be very tough, right? So feel free, you guys are here in the lecture anyway, so feel free to ask questions if, if you didn't get it. Does this make sense to you? OK, so tau2 will keep locking tau1 until it finishes execution. And then once tau2 finishes execution, even tau1 cannot start immediately because, again, it's blocked on the shared resource. So what is going to happen is tau3 will start first, release the lock. And once tau3 releases the lock, it will be, it will be preempted by tau1, and then tau1 can continue executing. Make sense? Think of what was, what if the deadline of tau1 is here? This down arrow we have here, that's not very clear. Tau1 missed its deadline. Why? Because of the shared resource, right? Because of a lower priority task delayed, it, right? And it, there is a proof that, in fact, this, or you can think about it intuitively, that this priority inversion can, in fact, give you unbounded latency. I can always come up with a case where there is an access to shared resource and they have been delayed, right? And in that case, well, you wait indefinitely, right? Is this a problem? Well, it's definitely a very big problem. And uh, I might have mentioned already to you this uh, Mars Pathfinder crashing. Uh, I guess I might, maybe in earlier lecture zero, I, I had a, a video or a piece of news. Uh, why why uh, this Mars Pathfinder crash? Uh, well, because it had a priority inversion problem in its schedule, right? So this exact problem we're discussing right now caused a multi-billion project to collapse at one point because of it, right? because of priority inversion. And you guys can, can watch videos explaining this on YouTube or look into the news. The good thing is that it didn't completely crash because they were able to remotely batch the operating system. So they updated the OS scheduler to, in fact, avoid priority inversion. You might think right now, well, but that's something that is very easy to catch. In reality, not. If you have thousands of lines of code of a kernel and you have a lot of cases, you might end up with facing a priority inversion as simple as this one because you didn't take care of it, right? And this is why, if you remember lecture zero, verification takes 40% or more of, of the cycle of, uh, of the system design. Good? Okay, what is the solution for it? There must be a solution. Right? We cannot really say, well, because of sharing resources, I cannot schedule those tasks. Sharing resources is the reality in most, uh, in most embedded systems, not just the Pathfinder, but automotive, avionics, any other one. So what do we do? There is what we call priority inheritance protocol, BIB. What does it do? So it's a solution that works for fixed priority scheduling, and it's very intuitive. Say, in fact, while a task can block a higher priority task, I must inherit its priority. So what does this mean? Well, if I go back here, tau2, uh, well, simply blocked tau1 because it blocked tau3. But if you say at one point, which is this point here, tau1, what it's waiting for? It's waiting for a resource from tau3. So what is the only solution? The only solution is tau1 is important. Let's make tau3 important, right? Why we want to make it important? Because there is a dependency chain between tau3 and tau1. So the, the priority inheritance protocol from the name inheritance, a lower priority task inherits the priority of a higher one to be able to, well, complete its job, release the resource, and give it to the higher priority task. Because right now, well, there is a dependency between the higher priority and lower priority. You must make the lower priority a higher priority one, up until to the point that you break this dependency. Where is that point? When do I break dependency? Once tau3 gives up the resource. Once you give up the resource, you go back again to a lower priority task that no one cares about you in the system, right? So as far as you have something that someone important in the system cares about, you are important. 
once you give it up, well, you lost, you lost your privilege, right? This is just ironically what the IP is. Right? So if we see how does it really work in reality, I will have exactly the same example. I start from time zero, tau three starts. After two time units, it acquires the green resource, start executing on it, and then it's being preempted by tau one. Tau one executes for two time units and wait for the resource. At that point of time, tau three will inherit the priority of tau one because there is a dependency that has been created, right? This asking for the resource is creating that dependency. So tau three start executing. What is different from the previous example is that at this time unit, tau two is no longer able to preempt tau three. Why? Because according to rhythm tonic, you only preempt a task with a lower priority than you. But I have elevated the priority of tau three to be similar to tau one, which means tau three right now at this time in instance, at this time stamp is higher priority than tau two. So tau two cannot preempt tau three at this point which means it allows tau3 to continue executing until it releases the resource. Once it releases the resource, it goes back again to a lower priority task, but at that moment, tau1 is being well, freed because it has the resources asking for. So it becomes active again. And once it becomes active again, well, it's the highest priority task in the system. So it starts executing until it finishes, and then tau2 can start. So we don't see the priority in her in, uh, inversion that we have seen in the previous slide. Again, let's stop for a second and see if that makes sense or you guys have questions. Does this make sense? Okay. So one, uh, one problem here with the system is, well, tau2 is in fact suffering because of tau3 delay, right? Because I elevated the priority of tau3. Right? Uh, well, this is necessary to release tau one, but this impacts the execution time of tau two, right? The problem, if we also want to, well, generalize the concept, the problem increases more if you have more than one resource, right? So we had this example here for a single resource, a single critical section, a single sensor, a single IO that is shared with the tasks. In the reality, multiple tasks share multiple resources, right? You don't share one resource at a time. Well, in your thread code, you have multiple critical sections, or in the code you guys have written in lab one and lab two, well, you have multiple tasks that access in the same time, well, the terminal or the uh, SPI or the I2C, whatever interfaces you are using. So those are resources that you, you also share memory if you have a, a, well, a more advanced system. So in that case, resources are generally several in the system. And this creates the problem of nested resource. So let's see this interesting example. So I have four tasks in my system, tau one to tau four, similar to before. We define the priority in ascending order, which means tau one is the highest, tau four is the, is the least. At time zero, let's say the system does not have anything other than tau four job, so it starts it. Once tau four starts executing, say for one computation unit, it, it asks for resource A. Does anyone have resource A, the green resource? No, so I can acquire it easily. So I obtain the, the lock and acquire it. And then after I execute for one time unit, I'm being pre-ended by a higher priority task. Let's say we assume red monotonic here. So tau3 arrives and then it preempts tau4. Tau3 starts executing, well, similar to the previous case, transfer one time unit, asks for another resource now, which is resource P. The, the orange resource. Is resource B free? Yes, no one has it, so I can acquire it. Start executing for one time unit, and then tau2 arrives. Tau2 is a higher priority, so I'm being preempted. Put in mind that at this time unit here, time unit four, the two resources are busy, right? They are being acquired, but not released yet, right? This is, this is important. And then tau2 starts executing. It goes through three computation units. And then afterwards, it's being preempted by the higher priority tau1. Tau1 starts for one computation unit, and then it asks for resource P. Well, what happens for resource P? It's, it's not free. It's busy, right? But now we have learned about priority inversion protocol, uh, priority inheritance protocol, and then I can solve it. How do I solve it? Once tau1 asks for that resource, 
who has it? Tau three, elevate the priority of tau three, right? So I do priority inheritance here. Which means at this time unit, tau three obtains the priority of tau one, right? By doing this, you enable tau three to run because now it has the highest priority in the system. It runs for one time unit and releases the resource. Once it releases the resource, well, what happens? Oh no, I didn't release the resource yet, so my, my apology. It executes in resource P, but then asks for resource A. Here comes the nesting of the resources. Now it becomes a little bit more problematic. Tau3 is asking for resource A. Who has resource A? Well, resource A is owned by Tau4. If I apply exactly the same algorithm, priority inheritance, I would say Tau4 would have to get to the priority of which task? What do you think? Tau1 eventually, yeah. So it will take Tau3 and then Tau3 is, well, now Tau1, so it will get Tau1 priority, which means, well, Tau4 will get the priority of Tau1 and start executing. Once it gives up the resource, the green resource with resource B, which is being asked by Tau3, uh, it, it will go back to its priority, right? Because we said you only inherit the priority until you release the resource that well, the important task is asking about, right? So at that point, you go back to your original priority, which means you get blocked because according to rhythm monotonic, there is a higher priority task that is waiting for that resource, please. Yeah, yeah, well, we, we use W and, and, and SW for waiting for the resource. So it's basically, think of it like from a semaphore perspective or a critical section perspective, you acquire and then you release. So W, wait for the resource until you obtain it. And S means basically you are done with that resource, right? So you release it. So once I'm done with the green resource here, I release it, which means I go back to my original priority. And then Tau3 will start executing on the A resource. Once it finishes it, it releases it, but no one is asking for A for now. So it doesn't really matter, nothing is changing. But then once it releases A, it goes back to B, which it has. So it will continue executing in B. And once it releases B here, Tau1 can start executing. So at that moment, Tau3 will lose its Tau1 priority and go back to its original priority. And then, you start executing tau1 that has been waiting up until this moment for that resource. So tau1 start executing on that resource, it acquire it, finish it, and then go back to its computation and finishes here. Once it finishes, well, tau1 is the highest priority, I'm done. The, re the, the rate monotonic schedule will look into the task queue and pick the one with the highest priority. What is the one with the highest priority is tau2. Start executing it until done, and then go back to the, long, the one with the next priority, and then et cetera, et cetera. Does this make sense? You see how nested resources can, well, you can apply the BIB algorithm basically iteratively, right? Okay. okay. The problem with this is you might be suffering what we call double blocking. So if I go to, to, to that example here of tau1, uh, let's say, Tau1 will, is going to be asking for two resources that are owned by two different lower priority tasks. So here, well, I, I, again, like the, the similar setup that we do at the beginning, the lower priority task starts, acquires a resource, and then get preempted. And then the next one starts, acquires another resource, and get preempted. So at that moment, again, A and B are completely busy. They are acquired and not released. The higher priority task, which is Tau1, start executing, and then ask for, uh, for B. So at that moment, you have to wait to, well, release B. So you inherit the priority, Tau2 inherit the priority of Tau1 because B, B is owned by Tau2. Once Tau2 finishes, Tau1 can start. And then it continues for some time, and then it asks for another resource A. And then again, it, uh, it, well, A is owned by which task? By Tau3. So you have to wait for it. You inherit the priority. You allow Tau3 to go through. And then once it finishes executing, you go back again to Tau1. So we have applied the, the priority inheritance protocol and we don't have any priority in, uh, inversion, right? So the problem we have discussed at the beginning of, of this section is solved, right? But now we are focusing on another problem or a little bit on optimization. If I think about Tau1, which is the highest priority task in the system, you see that in this example, it's suffering from what we call double block, 
right? What is double clocking? Every, well, the two resources you are asking for, you have been waiting for. So you have to wait for two periods of time here, blocked by a lower periodic task. Okay. Well, can I generalize this? Yes, if you have n tasks in your system, well, I can really be uh, delayed by n minus one blockings, right? Because every single lower priority task might be acquiring a resource that I want and I have to wait for it, right? Well, why we care about this? Because put in mind tau one is the highest priority task in your system. Well, in the Pathfinder example, that, that the one we gave, for example, it might be this is the, well, controlling engine. Right? Or this is the environment sensing to make sure that you don't fall yourself into something unsafe. Or this is the airbag in a car, right? Or this is the motor control in a car, right? Or this is the base uh, regulator in a base maker in a base. So this is the one that you really care about. Being blocked by every single lower priority task, this defeats the fixed priority scheduling algorithm, right? Because RM originally, main purpose of fixed priority is to say the task with the highest priority does not care about the lower priority ones, right? Every time I arrive, I preempt the lower priority one and I continue executing. Even with BIB, right now, that's not really the case. Every time I ask for a resource that is being shared by a lower priority task, I have to wait for some time. If I ask you, and this is in fact a topic of research papers, if I ask you a question in the exam as well, let's compute the worst case execution time of tau one, and I give you some example of shared resources. So what do you think? So how can we do it? So in, in other words, if we put it into numbers, I will tell you, let's say, well, we, we take the example of two resources first. So let's say I uh, resource A is a critical section, which is like number of instructions, which means I can really bound its execution time. For example, if this hundred instructions, I know that it's an add or subtract or something else. I know how much time does it take in the pipeline to execute it. So I can derive a computation bound in the number. So let's say resource A, in worst case, anyone that is accessing resource A, if it's uninterrupted at all, it takes 30 cycles to finish. And then resource B might be 50 cycles. And then I tell you, well, tau one can really ask for each resource once, for example. So we have to bound how many times you ask for the resource, right? So in that case, to bound the overall execution time of tau one, in addition to its computation, you have to add all the blocking times, right? If you look into the figure we have here, I started here and I finished here. If I try to assess this period of time, it's composed of these blue parts, which are my pure computation, but it's also composed of, well, the colors, which is my execution on the resource. And the third part is my blockings, right? The parts that have been waiting for the resources to be released, right? Do I, can I bound the computation? Yes, this comes from the task bound. We have CI, for, remember from the task model, sorry. So we know that tau one, has C1 and uh, T1 and D1, for example, right? C1 is my worst case execution time. So I have a bound on C1. In our example here, C1 is what? Two units, two units, one, so it's five time units. So I have a bound on the blue part. What about the green and the orange? Do I have a bound on them? These examples are a bit involved with mathematics. So you guys have contribute to make sure you follow. Uh, you want me to repeat, I can repeat. So, so simply we said, I look into the, how to analyze a task. What give, what, what a real-time engineer really, real-time systems designer do in analyzing a task. It looks into all the possible delays or latencies that are suffered by that task, right? In our example here, these are three things, or in reality four things, but I'm combining the orange and the green. The first one is my original computation. This is the one that we have been considering last lecture without talking about resources at all. And we said, do we have a bound on the blue one? Yes, this comes from the task model, right? Well, which we said before, you can obtain using static analysis or running the tasks for millions of times and then take the worst time, right? So I have I have C1 number as part of, it's given to me, right? And in this example, it's five time units. And then I look into the second type, which is the orange and the green, which is accessing the resources. Do I have a bound on them? Can I really give a similar number to five? What do you think? Yeah. 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 I already give you the numbers of accessing the resources. I told you that for all the tasks, that's the worst time you take to access these critical sections, which means if tau one accessing the orange resource, which is B, 
in worst case, it can take 50 cycles, right? So in that case, for the orange one, I take 50. And well, as your friend said, for the green one, I take 30, right? Well, this is a very large number here in, in our example. Uh, yeah, let's let's keep them and ignore, ignore about the time unit stuff, but have the numbers with 53. Then the harder question comes into, into play. There is one remaining component. If you sum all this up, this in fact does not resemble the total worst case execution time, right? There is one additional component that we left behind, which is the time that you have to spend being blocked waiting for these resources. How can I bound these? What do you think? Which is basically the empty, the empty ones here, those ones, the blocking one here and the blocking one here. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's basically saying, OK, what I'm doing right now, I'm waiting for a lower value task to release it. What is the worst in instance? The worst in instance that I ask for the resource just directly after, one cycle after the lower bridge one obtained it, right? Which means I have to wait for the full period minus one, but you can ignore the minus one now, the full period of this critical section to be executed by the lower priority task. So for example, here, if I'm waiting for the, the, the B resource, the orange one, and I can ask you, well, in, in our example, well, here, Tau 2 finished most of its time in B2, but in, in reality, in worst case, that's not the case. In, in worst case, Tau 2 are just barely started, right? So in that case, I have to spend the 50. And then what about the A1? Similar. I can assume in worst case that I ask for A just directly after Tau 3 obtains it, which means I have to wait for Tau 3 to release it, and this is going to be 30 time minutes, right? So this would be the total worst case execution time of my task. Right. And then as part of the task model, if I have a deadline here that is given to you, then you can do your usual scheduling algorithm by saying, well, do I have this task schedulable? Which means it meets this deadline or not. You compare the total execution time to the deadline. If it's less than yes, it's schedulable. If not, then it's not schedulable. Right. So this is an exercise that is done to analyze that task. Right. Makes sense. It might be an example of a, a problem in the midterm. Um, there's no meter in the final set. Yeah. If there were more tasks, kind of, you have to consider the possibility that resource A or B got blocked by another lower priority task. Excellent question. Excellent question. Up until now, we're talking about the task that is the highest priority, which means once you ask for a resource, you have to wait only for one lower priority task to release it. And this was the next part I was going to talk about. If you want instead, to analyze tau2, for example, well, the reason that maybe it's not very suitable to talk about tau2 is we know that tau2 is lower priority than tau1 anyway. So in reality, tau2 can be preempted by tau1 at any time, and also tau2 might be waiting for tau1 asking for resources all the time. So you cannot really drive a realistic bound. But in reality, in real practice cases, that's not the case. Why? Because people like maybe that's an engineering question. It's a little bit tough question, so it's a bonus mark. So what I'm saying right now might make sense theoretical. That we were, we were able to drive a bound, and, and you have to pay attention. We were able to drive a bound on the highest priority task because this is a flexible priority schedule. That one is the highest one. It preempts anyone else, so it has no problem at all. And the only problem is that it has to wait for one resource to finish from one lower priority. On the other hand, if I was to analyze tau2 or tau3 instead, it's a little bit more complex because assume, for example, I'm analyzing tau2 and the resource is owned by tau1. Now there is no priority in, in, in inversion or anything. Maybe tau1 finishes the resource and starts exactly the same resource one cycle after, right? So in that case, you obtain it, right? So there is no ordering, it's fixed priority, which means theoretically you have an infinite bound, like there is no bound. Right? I can read, wait indefinitely, but in reality, that's not the case. So the bonus mark is why you might think that's not the case. What conditions I can add, which are practical conditions that can give me a bound even in the medium or lower priority tasks? What do you think? From, from the shared critical section perspective, please. Yeah. Well, that's an excellent answer, but now you are changing the scheduling algorithm, right? 
So for example, you are saying, well, I apply something like EDF, where, well, the more time I'm waiting, my deadline is approaching, so I, I get my priority elevated. But I would say it's an excellent answer. It might be a practical answer, but it's the easier answer here. So let me constrain you more and say, I leave RM as is. It's fixed priority. I don't change my priority, right? But but you get the bonus mark because it's it's a correct answer. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yes, that's a very important one. But yeah, but that's partially true. That's that's its own. It's a necessary but not sufficient. Which means I need to do this, but it's not sufficient. Is it only the time when I access the resource? How much time? Because I already gave you that bound, right? There is already a bound on once you access a resource, how much time you spend on it, right? But there is one additional element. So if you remember the interrupts, we have went through it, yeah. Exactly, thank you. So these two combined are sufficient to drive a bound. How much time do I spend in the resource? And how many times a task in worst case can access that resource? If you remember our analysis for the interrupt, we have done exactly the same thing. We said you have your interrupt frequency and you have your interrupt busy time. And then you multiply both together, you get the utilization of the interrupt, right? So now, if I can say, in worst case, that one, during one period, can only access a resource three times. In worst case, tau two would have to wait for all the three times from tau one. Each time is going to consume 30 cycles. Then in total, I get 90 cycles, right? And the same thing for, for, for uh, resource two. So you have to bound number of times accessing a resource and how much time you spend there. Luckily, this is, in fact, a practical assumption because this resource is, for example, a sensor. You know from your software that I need to access this sensor, well, one time every one millisecond, 10 times. Every, th th there is an inherent design that really limits how many, many times you access that resource, right? So it's not theoretical. Well, even if theoretically it's, 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 it's infinite, in the reality, there is some sort of a bound there, right? So, yeah, everyone gave an answer. You, you guys send me your, your, your email. Your, um, your name by email after after the lecture. Yeah, so it's, it's an interesting discussion. For everyone else, is that clear? So if I'm able to bound how many times each task can access each resource and how much time any task in worst case, in worst case takes for a resource, I can drive a bound, no matter really whether for the highest priority task or the lower one. Good. But now going back to our uh, to our discussion, if I want to uh, well, if I if I if I if I care about the tau one, which is the the one with the highest priority oh, in in the system, and ignore about like bounding all the other all the other tasks, we still suffer from this double blocking, right? Yes, we accounted for it, we obtained the bound, but can we do better? I mean, as I mentioned, making the higher priority task wait for every single lower priority task to release a resource in worst case, is something that defeats the fixed priority concept because I'm well, at certain points, I'm no longer higher priority. I have to wait, right? So, which, which, what, what we call uh, the multiple blocking problem. A higher priority task can be blocked multiple times because of accessing resources that are shared by lower priority tasks. BI, BI algorithm does not solve it, right? How to improve over it? Well, we can improve by adding the limitation that we also discussed right now. But instead of bounding it by the number, I bought by design, by construction, a limit on the ability of lower priority tasks to enter a critical section. And here I'm giving you an example of, of, a, of a resource, but let's see it in, in reality. Uh, some, sometimes it's called priority ceiling, which is a very, very common algorithm in, uh, in real time systems. So let's see how does, how does this really work. So I start my same example, tau three lower starts, asks for A, and then being interrupted by tau two. Uh, well, here tau two is blocked by tau three. Why tau two is blocked by tau three? This example is a little bit incorrect. Ceiling of both resource priority of tau one. Ah, uh, yeah, I see. Okay, okay. So this is to apply to to. Okay, that makes sense. This is to prevent the double blocking. So you look into your system at the beginning and you say, I look into, for example, the highest priority task. I see what resources it accesses, right? It's resource A and resource B. 
what I'm going to do is I say at any point, so I, I inherit the priority. Well, in an essence, you inherit the priority of the task, but not for the lower priority task. Instead, you inherit it for the resource itself, right? This, this is in reality what it is. This is why it's called priority seeding, is you, you look into your resource, you look into all the tasks that access this resource, and you assign a priority for that resource according to the highest priority of a task that is accessing it. For example, just to imagine how we do it, that one is accessing resource A and B, orange and green. In that case, I would say these two resources, in fact, have the priority of A, which means any other task, any task in the system, when accessing A, or B in reality, they will have the highest priority, which is tau one priority. So by doing this, tau three starts, tau three starts executing in A. Once it starts executing in A, it gets the priority of tau one, even before tau one comes. That's the difference. That's a the subtle difference between priority ceiling and priority inheritance. Is you don't wait for the higher priority task to come. You just inherit the priority from the resource itself, and then. At this moment, tau3 is no longer interrupted by tau2. Why? Because tau3 has the highest priority in the system. So for, uh, well, at the, well, it's basically at that moment here. And then only after you release the resource, you go back to your original priority. So tau3 here goes back to tau3 priority, which allows tau2 to start. So in that sense, tau2 is blocked by tau3. But then you start executing. And once you start executing, well, tau2 requires resource P. Same thing applies. Resource P has the highest priority of tau1, which means, in fact, tau2 cannot be uh, uh, interrupted by tau1. So you release the resource. Uh, up until this point, it seems that, in fact, counterintuitive because you delay the tasks even at the beginning, right? But the premise here is once you release, all these resources. So in other words, what priority ceiling leads you is you might suffer some delays at the beginning, but once you start, you, you run uninterrupted, right? So once that one starts here, it has all the resources it needs, right? So which means it, it's only blocked one uh, once by the tau two, right? Compare this to the original problem here where you are being blocked twice, once by tau two and once by tau three. Questions? We have we have seen so many figures and scenarios. So if you have questions, ask. If you are lost, ask as well. Does this make sense? You need a break. Does anyone need a break? I need a break, but I want to say. <laughs> Yeah. So let's uh, let's have five minutes and then we start at eleven forty, okay? Because I, I I feel that's too much, right? Cramming all of this is is uh, yeah, just refresh your mind, talk to each other, stand, do anything, and then we start at eleven forty.
Okay, so let's start. If you are not here. Okay, so we continue with releasing some of the restrictions we have put into our model. So again, we started by the most strict one, single processor, periodic task model, idealistic, D is equal to T. We released D is equal to T. And this, this led us to have deadline monotonic instead of RM. We also released that this unit processor doesn't have any shared resources, independent task model. We discussed in the shared resources, what, what are the problems, priority in inversion, and what are the solutions for priority inheritance and priority ceiling. And then now we release one of the other uh, big constraints, which is only periodic task model. What if we have a periodic tasks in the system? Why this is particularly important? Because as we mentioned at the last lecture at the beginning, aperiodic tasks are in fact very apparent in most systems. I give you this uh, Fukushima example, right? Or the task that was responsible for once a bar power outage happens, you have to drop in the nuclear rods into the reactor to basically start releasing some of the temperature, right? Because of the cooling system is, is going down because of the power. I don't know if some of, some of you have watched the video or not. But simply, aperiodic tasks are very important in real-time systems because all of the time, well, in fact, some people even go one step further and say all embedded systems or all cyber-physical systems are reactive systems, right? So we give this name reactive system. So what does it mean to be reactive? They say this because you have to react something from the outside environment. Remember, again, our first lecture, a cyber-physical system will do sensing, communicating the data, processing it, and then actuating the physical world, right? So your cycle, your feedback loop 
all the time depends on some action that happened outside of your own cyber world, which is in the physical world, right? That's why you are a reactive. Well, you you, you are a reactive system, right? But being reactive, your task might must be event driven, right? Or at least some of your tasks must be event driven, which means they are aperiodic. They are not triggered based on time, but instead being triggered based on an external event, right? So why discussing uh, aperiodic tasks are very important. OK, so aperiodic tasks. So what is the problem of scheduling them? If you try to think intuitively before I go here into any of the problems we had with R and EDF. All of this is dependent on the fact that you know tasks are repeating every single period, right? So every T capital and then you, you release it again and we had this concept of hyper period of the scheduler, which is the uh, uh, least common divisor of all the periods of the tasks, right? If the task does not have a period, how can I really control it? When when do I need to account for its release time? It's very tough, right? Especially in theory, because again, it depends on an external event. So how can how can we model? It? And then researchers came up with this concept of uh, uh, a server, right? Which is a very interesting concept. It has been applied to so many again, many many domains. Uh, and and this concept is coming mainly from networking systems, right? So you say. Well, I have a set of schedulers, a lot of theory that uh, are concerned with periodic tasks. Now I'm throwing in this aperiodic task into your system. Can you really do it? Can you do it without changing everything else? Can you do it without changing years or decades of theory and analysis and all of the stuff you have or all the tools you have in your system? And the answer is yes. How? Well, if I'm not, if I don't want, I'm not willing to completely change my system, and the event-driven task is out of outside of my hand, then I can model it differently. I can really force it to act as if it's a periodic, periodic task. How to do it? Well, insert a queue in the middle, right? So, what we discuss in periodic tasks is that at every single scheduling point, what what the scheduler will do is it will talk, look into all the task queues, see if there is a task that is ready. And then, and, and by the way, the Artos document that is shared with you on Avenue is, is a very good resource for these visualizations. Our task can be ready, blocked, uh, 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 what else? Finished executing and then releasing again, right? So they, they have the state machine for the tasks. From a, from a free Artos perspective, but it's a general concept. What a real-time scheduler will do is at every single scheduling decision, it will look into all the task queues, see if there is a ready job to schedule. And if there is a ready job, you look into all the priorities and based on your own algorithm, you pick the one that you elect, right? For a periodic task, well, I don't have its periods. So what to do? Well, insert the queue, we call it a server, and only look into that queue for us, like every single, well, every period of time, every T or every tau or like you put you put a limit into how to check that the queue. So at the beginning of the queue, which is this point, at the end of the queue, the aperiodic tasks arrive well with no distinct shape, right? They arrive aperiodically based on an event. But your scheduler looks here only every certain period of time, which I might just call T server. What does this mean? that in fact I can model the task that I see here as periodic task, right? Even if they are originally aperiodic, I was able to shape them, right? This is more like task reshaping, right? They arrive aperiodically, but I queue them and I only check them every period. So I transform it from a model perspective, the aperiodic tasks into periodic tasks. Does this make sense? Is that concept clear? This direct is in fact applied in so many systems, not only real time systems. If you want to shape something that is very wide to act with and you want some predictable, limited sort of action, you do it that way, right? You 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 queue it and you act with it into certain behavior. Make sense? Good. Is there any question? Okay, so how to design that server? Well, there are multiple approaches and there are well, tens of papers and multiple industrial solutions. One of them is, uh, well, what am I looking for? So, so how to design the server to meet the system goals? The first one is 
if I make my T, well, what do I mean by design? So simply just determine this T server, right? How to come up with a ability to check your Q, and what will be your Q signs. From a trade-off perspective, if I keep this T, the checking period of the server, very long, what do you expect to happen? So if I increase this too much, yeah, yeah, the queue will fill up, and even if the queue does not fill up, the periodic task or tasks that are waiting there, the response time will be very slow, right? So if you want to take an action, because these tasks are still important, right? Think of this reactor uh, event-driven task in, in a nuclear uh, plant, still very important. So if you don't respond within a time, well, it's very problematic, right? So you have to make sure that you also meet the requirements of the tasks there. So if you wait for a long time before you check, the response time of the aperiodic task will increase a lot, which is no good. That's that's one thing. What if I make it very short? What if I check well, every cycle or two cycles? On the other hand, the other three, yeah. Uh, you might not have uh, tasks in the server be wasting cycles. Yes, that's one possibility. Yeah, but that's in fact the less severe uh, uh, result of doing that. What if you have a lot of tasks in the server? Yeah, exactly. So th think of where think of the bigger system, right? So by by lowering, well, we said at the beginning that by increasing this a lot, you uh, kind of degrade the performance of these aberrated tasks. On the other hand, if you decrease them a lot, you serve them very quickly. But put in mind that your hardware has limited resources, which means those periodic tasks will, will be impacted a lot, right? So the trade-off here is how to make sure that the response time of the abiodic tasks is, well, satisfiable, meets the requirements, without impacting the requirements of the periodic tasks in the system, right? So that's the trade-off, good? So the first one written here is simply just caring about the abiodic task. The second one is caring about low overhead because it mentions overhead is the overhead that the server adds to the original periodic tasks in the system. Good. So I want to meet these two goals, and these two goals, in fact, have tension between them. Right? They, they must. You must come to a compromise between them. So solutions. First solution is, and it's it's the baseline solution, what we call background server. Uh, and and you you guys basically will see from once I say the solution, you would see what these goals we are really heavily tiered towards. Background server is saying, well, I look into that system. You know what? Originally, I did all my scheduling for this part of the system. If you want me to account for that part, I'm only going to consider it as in background. What background means? My scheduler will always favor the periodic tasks. Only look into the server if the CPU is idle and has nothing to do. This is what we mean by background. So only schedule the periodic ones in Slack slots, in the Slack time of the CPU. What do you think is this is favoring? So what, what goal of the two goals we are really addressing here and well, ignoring the other goal? Yeah. Yeah, we minimize the overhead a lot. But in fact, as if we are eliminating the overhead because I only execute on Slack, right? So those periodic tasks, so it's one extreme, almost no overhead. But the big problem is, well, you ignore completely any requirement from those aberuric tasks. So it's it's too bad. The response time of the aberuric task can be very, very high, right? So that's one extreme side of things. Good. Second solution is, and that the more practical solution is, you don't really go to that extreme or the other extreme. What you do is you say, I'm going to assign requirements to my server as if, again, it's a set of periodic tasks. So I'm going to give it a budget, and usually this is referred to as budgeting algorithm, right? Or budget-based server. So each server is assigned a budget queue, and then a period TR. And I model it as a periodic task in the system. My budget will be the execution time of the periodic task, because remember our periodic task sets has a CI and then TI. So my QI of the server will be modeled as if it's a computation time because it's meeting its meaning intuitively a budget is once I start executing the server, how much computation units I give it to it. And then the period is just simply the period, right? And by doing this, you can model the budget to meet the requirements of the average task 
well, you can basically compare all the deadlines of all the periodic tasks you have in your system with the budget you have, and on the same time, does not impact much or have a limited impact on the periodic tasks. Okay. If the budget is zero, so I start executing, and if the budget is zero, I'm done with my budget, so I'm done my, with my competition units, so I stop executing the server and go back to the periodic tasks. And then in the next period, I replenish the budget, right? So I have a new competition unit, so as if I have a new job from the periodic task. Good. Uh, there is, well, some additional optimization there. What happens if the scheduler picks the server? Because I have a new period, or I don't have something else in the system, but I don't have any task bending in the queue. There are two possible solutions. The naive solution is to say, well, I don't care. As a scheduler, I'm telling you as a server, once I give you, grant you access, I'm going to grant you access for a period of time that is equal to the budget, and then I'm going to stop you. But I don't have something to do right now, right? So, so it's just like I'm wasting that time. So in that case, well, you lose the budget in a useless thing. You don't really do anything. Some smart servers, some, some examples called sporadic server, you say, well, I store the budget for you. It's like budget is giving you some tokens and you use the tokens only when you need them. So if I want to schedule you and you have some tokens, so in a period, I come to you, I come to Ali and say, okay, how many tokens do I have? Five tokens. How many units do you really want to execute? Three tokens. Okay, use three and keep the two for the coming period. So you carry forward your budget into coming service. Why that's good? Because you don't waste your budget and you don't impact the rest of the system. So it's a, it's a clever way of doing it. So let's see examples, because it might be a little bit hard to, to, uh, to imagine. Uh, so let's say I have what, two periodic tasks, tau one and tau three, and then I have a server, which I model as a periodic task. And uh, assuming that I give Q to be two, which is my budget to be two, and my period of the server to be eight. I start executing, let's say it's fixed priority. Tau one starts executing. It runs for two time units and it's done, right? Because it's highest priority. And then now I look here. And then, uh, well, the server executes. It has a budget of two. And then once it executes, what, what does it mean to be a budget? It's the maximum computation time I can use the processor. So which means once I execute for two time units, I'm done, right? So my budget, if you look into the budget here, I'm starting as two. And once I start executing, I go up until zero, right? Every computation unit lo loses you one unit from the budget. And then you are done until you come to the new, to the new period. The interesting point here is that if you look into the new period of the, of the server, so the server has a new period here and it replenishes its, its budget. Once you start executing the problem, it only has one computation unit, not two, right? According to the dumb server, which is the first option we have here, I don't really care how much time you execute. You execute it for one time unit, but you are done. Well, your budget goes to zero and it replenishes again in the new period, right? And then you have to wait for the, for the replenishing. On the other hand, if I'm using a periodic, uh, uh, periodic server or sporadic server, you don't lose the budget, but instead you consume it when you need it. For example, here, if you look into the budget using the sporadic server, I didn't completely lose my, uh, my budget, but I'm using it later on once I have something else to do, right? So it saves your budget for later on. Good. Aside from these two optimizations or these two possibilities for the server, hopefully the concept itself is clear, which is I want to integrate a periodic task into my system. It's a little bit very tough because it's, it's, it's not shaped. It does not have a model, right? It's a periodic, it's event driven. What can I do? Well, put something in the middle that shapes it, which is a server, it's a queue. Put it in the queue and only pull out of the queue according to some metric, right? This metric is, we said, well, this metric can be uh, simply the first solution is, well, only do it in Slack or background. It's too bad for the response time of the abiotic. The better and practical solution, which is deployed in many systems, is use budget-based server where uh, 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 where 
I model my server as if it's periodic task with a budget that's equal to the competition time and the period that is similar to the period of the periodic task. And then, well, we said there are two solutions. One of them is once I grant you access, you have to use all your budget, otherwise you lose it. Another solution is say, well, that's not very fair. As far as you didn't use your full budget, you can keep it for the next activation. Good. Any question about how to model a periodic task into uh, well scheduling using periodic systems? Does make sense? Again, those those running examples, you have to go through yourself by hand uh, to be able to comprehend all of them, right? Because well, the, you are expected to really know how to model these, right? Okay, so continuing into again releasing more constraints instead of uh, and this, this is a big leap, in fact, moving from uni processor systems into multiple processor systems. All the problems we have discussed so far did not, in fact, bring into play anything related to multi core or multiple processors, right? Where we were thinking about a single processor that incorporates multiple tasks, might be with some shared resources. And uh, well, if you want to model tasks that can be periodic or abiodic, right? But what if you have a system that has multiple processors, right? Now the problem becomes a little bit much more complex, right? Uh, and, and, and again, there are literally tens of solutions, right? And, and just to let you know, this is still an open problem in industry and in research. For example, in avionics, there, there is a standard one, it's called DO178. Uh, it's, it's the avionics standard, how to really certify hardware for, for, for planes, for automotive, for, for avionics. Uh, up until now, they put very large constraints into how you can deploy multi-core into the critical systems of the, of the plane. And they force you to really partition, as we will see later on how to partition. Uh, and there was a very funny clause into 178 up until recently, which is, it was stating very clearly the following. If you want to certify your system, which is multi-core, you have to make sure all the time only one core out of the multi-core system is running at a time. What does this mean? It means, in fact, you're not utilizing your multi-core platform. You reduce it to a single core platform, right? So think, for example, I'm bringing a very powerful multi-thousand dollar SOC with, well, let's say, 64 cores. Maybe it's too much, 16 cores, okay? And then I want to certify both it into the avionics. Well, and you are telling me, out of these 16 cores, at any moment of time, only one of them can be running, right? Well, this is a waste of cost, right? So I, I'm not going to do this anyway. Why? Because the certification authorities know that scheduling tasks, especially the critical one, in those multi cores is a very complex and still open problem up until now, right? So they want to make sure that, well, you don't, my companies don't do something funny because they are looking for performance, while certification authorities care more about the safety of the plane, right? So I'm just wanting, like I, I want to pay, uh, to, to, to bring to your attention that it's still a very complex problem. What we're going to do in a street, instead of focusing on all these complexities, is to focus on the the the, the essence, the, the concepts, right? Generally speaking, there are two big directions into scheduling multiple tasks into multiple processor systems. One of them is called partitioning, and the second one is called global scheduling, right? The one that is most common in practice, especially for safety critical systems, is the partition system. And we'll see why, because it's much simpler. Simply in a partition system, which is the one we start with, you say, well, I statically, I have a set of resources, which is those multiple cores. So basically, I have my platform here that has multiple cores. And I have a set of tasks here, this is my task set that can be tens of tasks that I want to schedule in these processors. The problem with multiple processor is our original scheduling problem now becomes, in fact, two problems. The first one is how to map tasks to cores. So what tasks to one in what code, to run in which code, right? This, this, and then maybe run this. So you say tau one, tau three, go to core one, or processor one, tau 10 and tau 11 go to processor three, et cetera, et cetera. So the first problem is how to map tasks to cores, okay? The second problem is once you map tasks to cores, well, what do you think is the next problem? 
this is the problem we have been discussing all the way in the last lecture and up until now in this today's lecture, which is I have multiple tasks to be scheduled in a single processor system. So you have to schedule, right? So the first problem is the mapping, which is one task to run in what tasks to run in which core. The second one is the actual scheduling because you reduce the problem into a uniprocessor scheduling problem, right? Once you map your tasks to cores, the problem reduces to the uniprocessor scheduling problem, right? Good. So in partition systems, you answer the first question statically, right? So you know your set of cores, you know your set of tasks, and you say, I'm going to map tasks to cores statically before running the system, not dynamically changing. So you do a static mapping. Once you do this mapping, the scheduling again reduces to a single processor, uniprocessor system, right? Good. And by the way, this task to core mapping is in fact was shown to be an NB hard problem uh, because it reduces to a bend backing or knapsack problem. If, I don't know if you guys heard about this in, in 2SI. Did, did you hear about some of the algorithms that are out there? Knapsack, bend, uh, bend backing? Or, Okay, so it's, it's, it's a well-known algorithm in, in, in uh, even in software engineering. Don't worry about it right now. What it means is if you have a set of resources and you want to schedule, optimally schedule some sort of tasks into these resources, in general, this is a very big problem. It's, it's, it's a very hard to solve problem. NB means it's, uh, at least you know what is B and NB from the 2SI, right? It, it basically, that you, you, there is no linear solution for it, right? Uh, the very typical example of this, you can think of tasks and cores as, for example, rooms in the university and lectures, right? At the beginning of that, because it's a scheduling problem, at the beginning of the semester, the registrar's office has to come up with a schedule that is, satisfies all the that, all that classes schedules and map the classes to rooms, taking into account some constraints. For example, the room size, how many students, what are the requirements of media, et cetera, et cetera, right? This problem is again a very hard problem. It's, it's an MB complete problem in general. So you have to sit and put some heuristic there. Mapping tasks to cores is identical, is in fact can be proven to be reduced to the same problem as scheduling classes into rooms or scheduling uh, soccer games into uh, time slots and uh, well, football stadiums, right? So, so it's, it's any scheduling problem can be reduced to another one, right? Uh, or in a, in a company, for example, you are a manager and you have a set of employees like 20, 30, and you have a set of tasks that you want to do in this year, and you want to assign employees to tasks. Again, it's a scheduling problem, right? Uh, so partitioning is, again, addressing the, the two questions separately. Say, map tasks to course first statically using some sort of scheduling, which is very well studied across all areas, as I just told you. And then once you do this, for every single processor, you in fact have a uniprocessor scheduling problem, right? On the other hand, global scheduling, well, does not do this. Say, I'm going to map the tasks to cores also dynamically, not statically. I maintain a global queue for all the tasks, and then every single moment that I have a free CPU, I'm going to look into my queue and pick a task put it in that, that CPU. What is different from, from partition? If you look here in partition scheduling, we put a limit into what task to run in which code. For example, if I map tau one to core one, at any single moment, tau one cannot really run in core three or core four or any other, right? But in global scheduling, at one instance, tau one can be running in processor one. But then in next activation of the job, tau one might find processor 10 to, to be free. And in that case, it runs in processor 10. So global scheduling does not put an affinity into what task to run in which code, okay? which in a sense is flexible, good, but in another sense is in fact very complex because there is a lot of context switching into, into tasks as we'll discuss later on. Yeah, as I was saying, in BRAC's real-time adoption of multiple processor is very limited, especially for hard safety critical systems like avionics. Also in BRAC's, Partition scheduling is preferred because there are a lot of issues with global scheduling. One of them is because it's dynamic, so it's very hard to reason about. So it increases the unpredictability of the system. Tasks can migrate between cores, which means you add an additional overhead. 
and then it's much more complex to implement because well you need to make a lot of decisions and does not well that's the last part that's very important it has been shown that in some systems in fact is that not does not necessarily perform better than the partition scheme this the dynamic behavior does not always help you because the overhead might kill you good okay so let's start with the global scheduling and then we will jump into the partition scheme and by the way uh the tutorials that are not lab tutorials are going to cover a lot of scheduling problems because these, these are hard problems. We have more examples about them. Um, well, if I want to apply, yeah, you guys also feel free to read if you have another midterm and you are in time. I, I will make sure I finish before 12.20 uh, to give you some time to go to the exam. OK, so what is the problem? If I apply a fixed priority or ADF scheduling in multiple processors, it might not be, in fact, very good. Why? Because some of the tasks might be running for a very long time. So you might not make the best use of your resource. For example, assume I have two processors, processor A and processor B, and I have three tasks. Let's say tau 1 is executing into processor 1 for one time unit. Tau 2 is executing processor 2 or processor B for one time unit, and then both are done. Now I have tau3, which runs for a very long time. Uh, because tau3 runs uninterruptedly, so it will keep running, but the problem is that it might be barely schedulable using EDF. Uh, because again, EDF here does not help you. All of them have the same, the same deadline. Now, global scheduling, or be fair scheduling, which is one sort of a global scheduling, is shown to be fair for multiple processors. So first of all, we said EDF is optimal for unit processor. EDF is no longer optimal for multiple processor. Instead, there is this BFAIR algorithm, which is shown to be optimal for multiple processor using global schedule. What does it do? Instead of running the task as one big chunk, it splits the task into smaller chunks, and then try to allocate them into cores in a fair way. This is why it's called be fair. For example, even if uh, uh, tau3 runs for a very long time, because I split it into small chunks, I can run it into two processors simultaneously. So think, for example, about tau1, tau2, tau3 here. All of them have an initial time of six and a period of nine, and I have two processors. First of all, can I schedule them physically? I go back again to my utilization bound stuff. I have 6 over 9 plus 6 over 9 plus 6 over 9. What does this give me? 12, 18. So I have uh, 18 over 9. This is equal to 2. Can I stick with these tasks in a 2 processor? Well, yes, because the utilization in 2 processors in SUF1 is 2, right? So it can be scheduled. How do we do it? Be fair. Split the task into chunks. So for example, tau1 has a chunk of two units here. This one is executing in one processor, this one is executing another processor. In parallel to executing the first chunk of tau1, there is one chunk from tau2 that is executing in processor B, right? And then again, like I keep switching between chunks, good? So in that case, I'm able to schedule all the tasks in the two groups. Coming up with what is the chunk one term? Size is in fact one of the questions of be fair. Right here, we just assumed we have. Um, well, the good thing is that as far as well, you really have your similar to EDF in unit processor, your utilization bound here is the physical bound, which is if you have two cores, the, the utilization bound is two, three, three, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So that's the physical bound, maximum bound you can obtain. So that's a good thing which means your algorithm is optimal. The bad thing is that by splitting the task into chunks, you keep switching between tasks, right? Between task chunks. The problem is this algorithm does not take into account the real practical case that if I split task into small chunks and switch between tasks, this will entail overhead. For example, one chunk might be bringing some data to a cache of a processor or a memory, and then the other chunk will evict it. So when you go back, there is some sort of a switching overhead. 
when you take a switch in, in actual operating systems. So this is not taken into account uh, into this, uh, this global algorithm, nor in fact migrating task chunks between foods, right? For example, running processor A, and then the next chunk is in processor B, which means I need to migrate. But if this chunk is operating in some sort of a data set, you need to copy the data set from processor A to processor B, which again, B fair does not take into account. Okay, does that make sense? So we will cover a lot of problems in the, in the tutorials. So wait there. So now for the rest of the five minutes, let's wrap up the bigger picture again. So far, we have been talking about periodically activated tasks. We also consider the periodic ones, but we have been talking about single task or task set. In reality, if you go back again to our sense, communicate, process, and then actuate, we know that there is an end-to-end -end message for a task. Like for example, for the airbag example we had, there was a sensing task that collects data, send it to the processor, which will take a processing time. And then once you finish the processing, you send your decision to the actuating task will actuate it. If you think about project, uh, project, two, project one, which has been released already, you guys have a set of tasks that are given to you. We structure the, the, the project for you. One, well, one or multiple tasks are concerned, in fact, with the IOs, one of them with the, for the radio, the other one is for the terminal, the third one for the gyroscope uh, or, or the IMU in general. And then all of these tasks are basically sensing tasks, right? Or controlling tasks. And then you send all of this to a queue that is eventually being read by the ECU, which is another task you define, which is the control task. And then the control task takes an action to actuate the motor, right? Which can be another task. So if I want to bound the overall round feedback of the system, I need to think of all these tasks collectively, not as separate tasks, right? This is what we call an end-to-end -end delay. So there is a, you start on one core with one task, which can be, for example, a sensing task. And then once you collect the data, you send it to another task that need to take some action and actuate with another task. And in a real control system or in a real or automotive, for example, the car we do in the lab, you have to take care of the collective delay of all the tasks in your bath, not just a single task. Good? This is what we call an end-to-end -end delay. For example, if I want to model this, extend my model, I would say, I no longer think of tasks to be independent or even think access shared resources, but they don't care about each other. Now, to be able to model this dependency, you can say there are tasks that cannot be activated unless it receives a message from another task, right? For example, your control motor task cannot be activated unless it receives data from one of the sensor tasks in project one, right? How to model this in our theoretical model? Well, we'll use the feature that we added early last lecture, which is what we call a jitter. What is a jitter? A jitter is a delay that you add to the activation of the task. So we say tau2 cannot start until it receives the message from tau1 because it has this dependency here in this, in this example. And we model this as a jitter for tau2. The same thing, tau3 cannot start unless you receive a message from tau2, which again can be modeled as a jitter of tau3, right? So there is a possibility to model this dependency of end-to-end -end delay between tasks in our periodic task model. Good. Then the last thing is, how does this relate to all the control courses you have guys covered, for example, right? Uh, we mentioned that typically in a real-time embedded system, which is, by the way, is a control system, uh, periodic tasks are usually is a digital control. In reality, the quality of the control from control theory, and you guys know this better than me, it depends on your frequency of sensing actuation, which is the, 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 the actual physical wallet, uh, 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 well, interaction, and in the delay with the actuation related to the sense, right? So again, how much faster, faster or slower you process the frame per second data that is coming from a camera, right? That's basically 
the quality of your feedback control uh, loop in the in the control system, right? Scheduling decisions must take into account this control quality, right? Uh, and just to give you an example of how practical is this, in fact, well, my, my research lab does a lot of job in real time embedded scheduling stuff, right? And in reality, we have a lot of collaboration with control theory guys, like Professor Shaheen, for example, Professor Ali Imadi, that they do a lot of control theory, right? So we do a lot of collaborative projects because we have to care from the real time multiple perspective what is the control quality of the system? Again, I can model the, the car as a control system. In reality, Professor Shaheen has the third year course, which is a little bit equivalent to our fourth year embedded course because they also build the car there. But they build it from the control perspective, from the control theory perspective. So combining both worlds is very important if you think about the system level. From our scheduling perspective, which is what we discussed in this lecture and the previous lecture, what do I need to take into account? You need to take into account what is the quality of your feedback control. What do I mean by this? Again, in a feedback control, there is a sensing task. Well, there is an actuator task. There is a sensor task. There is a processor task. And there is another sensing task that does collect, uh, 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 well, the, the actual data from the reality, like the, the impact of your scheduling. And then you feed this and your control decision into, again, the sensor, and this is going to be a feedback control. So in reality, I take an action and resense the physical world and see whether my action has led to a correct decision or not. For example, in the last project in this course, project two, you are going to control the car autonomously using a camera and an ultrasonic. But the problem is, if you take a decision and you don't really keep sensing the physical world, for example, turn left because there is no obstacle in the left, but there is obstacle in front of you and you turn left and you don't keep sensing to keep actuating and assess your decision. After some time, you might end up finding a wall also in the left, right? So all the time, this feedback control that comes from the physical wallet must be incorporated efficiently into your system to be able to make sure you never hit an obstacle or hit a pedestrian in a car or for a drone, you never hit a tree or something, right? So the feedback quality, well, the quality of the feedback control has to be taken into account when you do the scheduling of your task. Uh, another final example is um, is is uh, in uh, well another project we have in the lab where we do this. I told you about this before. Like it's a healthcare domain, so we collect data from sensors of patients to collect ECG data, which is from hard data, and then we do machine learning on this to well predict some other vital signals, blood pressure, uh, oxygen levels, et cetera, respiratory, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is that this, again, another feedback control. The data is coming from the heart at a certain rate. I have to process it fast enough, take the action before the new data comes in, right? And for that purpose, my feedback control of the system has to close the loop faster than the arrival rate of my sensor data, right? And this is what basically controls the quality of the feedback control in a healthcare domain, right? So let's stop here. We are done, in fact, by this part. And uh, again, as I said, in the tutorials, we will cover many examples, and then we'll switch to another topic next next week. Uh, see you next week. Thank you. I'm not going to